That brings us to today's session then uh, about Clear Ideas, uh, which is our creativity and innovation training approach that we've developed uh, at the Institute of Work Psychology. Um, so, as I said, I'm Kamal Birdie. Uh, I'm a, an academic uh, in the Institute of Work Psychology, but I'm also a, a practicing occupational psychologist. So I work with lots of uh, organizations to um, put things into practice. So what we're going to be looking at in, in the session today is talk a little bit about why we need to have uh, creativity and innovation. Uh, talk then a bit about the, the development of clear ideas as an innovation training model. Um, talk about some examples of its use and impact and explain how the model works. So um, what do we mean by creativity? What do we mean by uh, innovation? Um, so creativity is about generating new uh, and valued ideas. Um, whereas innovation is about taking those ideas and then also putting them into practice uh, to produce new products, services, processes, policies, initiatives or strategies. And so what we're looking at is, is really innovation is both sides is about coming up with these new ideas and also putting them into practice. So why, why do we need to innovate? Um, well, things change and that means we need to do things differently. Uh, so we can see in the world there's climate change, there's declining resources, there's shifts in society, there's increasing expectations. There's also opportunities such as having um, um, uh, new markets opening up or new technologies that we could use. So it's quite important that we change along with those things. So we do need to um, be able to innovate, to be more innovative. And of course, I'm sure we can't avoid the fact that COVID is here and it's been here for a while and it probably will be for a long, another long while. And there's lots of uh, spill outs and implications uh, from that, um, uh, so that is really important that um, we are able to deal with big issues like this. How do we improve people's physical health, mental health? How do we help organisations recover and thrive as a result of COVID, for example? So that raises the question, what, what does help or hinder our creativity and innovation and, and how can we learn to be more creative and innovative? And so that drives us to then undertake some research to really find out what, uh, what, what makes that difference. So at IWP, we've been doing a search on this topic for a good number of years. So here's some examples of the types of things that we've done. We've undertaken literature reviews. Uh, we've done questionnaire surveys uh, of, of lots of organisations, look at barriers and facilitators of creativity. We've been following people through creativity training courses uh, by um, asking them to uh, fill in questionnaires before and after to see if there's changes in attitude, skills, behaviour. So just an example of some of the research that we've done. Um, you can read more about this in, in the paper that I flagged up uh, at the beginning of the session. So out of that research, if we do want to help people become more creative and innovative, what, what are the sort of implications that for an innovation training intervention? Well, the research suggests we need to explain how various factors influence different parts of the innovation process, or what helps us come up with new ideas is different to what helps us put those into practice. And so in an innovation training program uh, or intervention, we need to develop the knowledge and skills needed for both generating ideas and also putting them into practice. Uh, as well as developing knowledge and skills, being innovative, being creative takes motivation. You also need confidence because oftentimes you're going against the status quo, so you need to be able to push things through. And we want to be able to use a simple, coherent and usable model to integrate different aspects. So, out of all that research, back in 2005, um, I, I developed a model called Clear Ideas based on the research as a way of communicating with organisations how we should be uh, communicating uh, with um, organisations about how to be more creative. Um, so here's some examples of workshops that I've been doing with the uh, Fire and Rescue Service, 
uh, with international development agencies uh, in the water sector, uh, for example, about how to become more uh, uh, creative and innovative in terms of uh, water sustainability. So what we know from our evaluations of, of running these types of workshops, um, it, we have um, feedback that says that, that people like, like the model, they find it usable, they find it practical, we find out that, we, that they improve, significant improve in their innovation competencies, and that, um, that they are doing things differently back at work, and in the longer scale, we do find some uh, new innovations emerging here. So here's some examples where people have used clear ideas techniques, for example, to reduce the cost of uh, fitting smoke alarms, uh, created new road safety communication packages for schools, um, help redevelop adult social care services. So we've tried to follow it through. It's all research based and we can see that people have learned and applied uh, these techniques to actually innovate in the workplace to generate some positive things as we can see here and, and I'll maybe touch on some of the examples as we go through the sessions. So I've talked about the model uh, generally and what it does and where it comes from but you know what, the, the, what is it what does it actually look like well as you might have guessed it's an acronym uh, so we have the clear bit and the ideas bit the ideas bit is about creative coming up with ideas uh, but the clear bit is about actually what you do with those ideas to put them into practice. And, and, and back in 2005, there seemed to be a bit, a bit of a gap. There seemed to be a few creativity training uh, programs out there, but not a lot of them talked about what you do to put, to put things into practice. So we're going to start off then. I'm going to start talking about the idea stage. And um, maybe you can help me with some of this as we go along as well. So. Um, we have the first I ideas uh, we call illuminate. This is where you shine a light on something that you want to do better. So it could be a problem that you're facing, it could be an opportunity. And when we talk about innovation, people usually think of you know a new gadget, new type of phone, etc. But innovations are about changes around lots of things like the processes, how things are done. Uh, it might be new strategies, maybe new policies, maybe the goals of your organisation. So a company like Nokia, which has been around for quite a long time, started out in Finland uh, as, a, as a wood, pulp and rubber manufacturer. But over the years, it innovated its goals, its function as an organisation to move into the high technology uh, area. But what we're saying here is that when you shine a light, you want to pick something to work on that, that is strategically important to you, your team, your organisation, or, or society more generally. You're going to be spending time on this, so you want to pick something that is important. Uh, it doesn't have to be a problem. Uh, if you're really into continuous improvement, it might be just shining that light on something that's going okay, and then um, uh, then saying, okay, can we do it any better? So a key phrase I get people to do at this stage is to think uh, in terms of the, the how do I or how do we um, do something better. So, you know, this might be a chance for you just to reflect if you've got uh, a challenge or a problem in your organization you're trying to do better. You might just want to have a think about this as we talk through the steps to see how you might tackle that as well. So, I'll just give you a minute to think about that. So, these are some of the problems that our workshop participants have tackled before. Uh, so, for example, how do we um, reduce delays in hospital theater operation times? How do we reduce burglary rates? That's a police organisation, as you might expect. How do we reduce unemployment in young people? How do we reduce le leakages in water pipes? So these how do we, that how do we phrase is quite powerful because it helps you start setting a direction in terms of what to tackle and what to go for. So uh, to help in this, this webinar, I'm going to introduce you to a company called Footwear Limited um, that's it's not a real company, it's just made up uh, for the purposes uh, of the webinar, for the training. Uh, if you do find out there is a company called Footwear Limited, do let me know. Uh, we, don't want to, we don't want to insult anyone there. So this company, let's say, has been running for quite a, a number of years, uh, making you know, nice leather shoes and tartan slippers. But it, it's suffering now, it's financially struggling uh, and it's not doing so well. Um, as they say, you know, it, it's, it's quite a difficult sector to be in. 
there might be lots of new competitors there now and you know there's no business like shoe business as they say so the organization's financially struggling and so how do we is how do we overcome the problem of declining profits for footwear limited and, that, and we'll use that as an example to go through the, the, the rest of the steps for footwear limit, uh, <clears throat> of clear ideas so the second step we talk about is before we jump to solutions, we, we do the diagnose stage. So this is really understanding why we're having the problems in the first place. This is where we might need to do a bit of analysis, a bit of research to get a good understanding of what the causes of our problems are. Why are our profits declining so much? Um, we might do observation. We might do analysis of data. We might do focus groups with customers. We might look at data across the sector. So there's three parts of this diagnose stage that, that are really important today. So first of all is to identify what all the different causes of your problem uh, may be. So sometimes we only get part a, a part of view of a problem. We don't really get the rounded view of what the different contributors are. So here it's quite important to bring in different stakeholder perspectives. So we might bring in customers, we might bring in suppliers, we might bring in uh, people who are making the shoes, people who are designing the shoes, to get a rounded view of what do they think that uh, are the different contributors to the problem. So we get quite a rich map of maybe the 10, 11, 12 reasons why we think that profits are de declining in the company. Now, sometimes we leave it at that. We, we, we unpack, we map causes, but then we get paralyzed and think, oh my God, you know, there's too much, too many causes, we can't deal with it. So stage two is to then, to start making some progress is to prioritize what we think the most important causes actually are. Um, and if we do that, then we can start saying, okay, well, if this is the biggest barrier or second biggest barrier, then if we start tackling those, we'll start making some inroads into this problem and help us make some progress. So the third aspect then is once we prioritize what we think are the biggest contributors, we can refocus our challenge on the most important causes. So for example, in Footwear Limited, we've done a bit of causal mapping. We, we've looked at different stakeholders and we've sort of gone down this logic route of why our profits might have gone down by 20%. So one route is because costs are going up. Why are costs going up? Because materials are becoming more expensive and electricity costs have risen. Uh, but another route is that our sales are actually going down. They're going down quite a lot and actually that's more of a major contributor. So we have to understand why sales are going down. We can see the demand for our products is declining. Why is demand declining? Well, when we talk to our customers and focus groups and see what's being said about us on social media, we can see our shoes uh, are being seen as old fashioned. And why is that? Well, when we look at it, we've been producing the same footwear for the last 30 years. So that's a main cause of why we're, we're having problems. If we could produce something new, then hopefully we'll be seen as having more sort of up-to-date trendy footwear uh, demand should hopefully increase and hopefully that should uh, improve our sales so at the end of the diagnose stage we can say okay the problem of declining profits is significantly caused by customers thinking our shoes are too old-fashioned so they buy our competitors instead so what we want then is to introduce a great new type of footwear or footwear accessory to wow the customers as being the up-to-date item that they must just have. Um, so I've used some sort of strong language in there. And, and language is quite an important way to frame ambition in terms of what you're doing. We could just say we want something new uh, about footwear that will attract more people. But, you know, if you, if you aim for the stars, you might reach the moon. You know, if you aim for, for Derby, you'll probably get to Derby. So, Sometimes by pushing uh, your aims to be quite uh, grand, you can make more progress than if you just aim for a, a small incremental change. So we can talk about incremental versus radical innovations here, but we need something more radical in footwear limited, really just to, to lift us up and, and take us forward. So now we've got a proper focus about what we need to uh, come up with some creative solutions for. We can enter what I call the erupt stage this is where we come up with ideas and there's a few key principles here so one is we need to generate as many ideas as possible it's a nice quote from linus pauling the the, the prize-winning scientist there the best way to get good ideas is to get lots of ideas and throw the bad ones away 
Uh, and really, it is, there's logic there as well, lots of creative problem solving research supports this, that the more ideas you have, the more likely you are to get more novel, original, uh, different ones. So we want to, uh, second principle here is not just generate lots of ideas, but we need to separate the degeneration of ideas from the judgment of those ideas. So a key phrase here is lots of ands, no buts. So the word but is a big killer for creativity. If you sort of reflect on situations where you've been, where you're trying to come up with new ideas and someone says, but I'm not sure people would like it, but it's a bit difficult, isn't it? But we're not really sure about that. Once you start introducing the word but, you stop the flow of ideas. You know, and, and it might be the 10th, 15th, 20th, 30th idea that would make the difference. Um, but if you um, already stop the flow of ideas at the third or fourth idea, then, then you're not going to be taken anywhere. So we're trying to generate lots of ideas. Uh, we're not judging ideas at this stage. We're going to do that later on because we want the nice crop of ideas to actually have a look at. And those are the key tools, but we can also introduce um, creative thinking triggers just to help us think even more differently, to put more ideas on the table. And um, I can explain sort of that there are lots of creative thinking techniques out there. I've listed some of the schools of creative thinking at the bottom of this slide, synectics, which is used for analogies and metaphors. Morphological analysis about breaking problems down and recombining them into, into, into novel combinations. Edward de Bono, big uh, creative thinking guru in, the, in the, the business world, has his lateral thinking techniques. Triz is a Russian based approach. There's an underlying principle that lots of these techniques have, which, which I'll explain like this. So let's say we start off with our real world problem. And um, we tend to start off thinking about our real world solution straight away. What have we done before? What could we do? What could we adapt? Uh, and that we start developing our solutions uh, in a sort of logical manner. But what these techniques are, are very good at doing is, is pushing us into somewhere where I call fantasy land. It's saying, put, let's push us over there into fantasy land. And in fantasy land, it's a great place to be. You know, the sun's always shining. Um, you know, there are unicorns, um, there's, uh, there's no COVID. It, it's a great place to be. And, and, the, and in this world, you're encouraged to experiment and explore new ways and new ideas of, of approaching uh, that problem. So depending on which creative thinking technique you're using, there'll be different rules. You might have an army of smart little people who can solve your problem. What would they do to solve your problem? You might be looking at uh, an analogy, uh, something else that's done really well. How does that work? Can we translate? You know, is there something in nature that works really well that we can learn from, that we can apply to our real world problem? So we're encouraged to play in fantasy land and um, come up with some ideas. And after a period of time, we're then asked to say, look, can we then translate those ideas back into the real world? Is there a stepping stone back? Either we can directly take them back into our real world uh, situation or there might be the seed of something that we could do in the real world. So I'll give you an example from one of my workshops. Uh, we had a group that was from a public sector uh, council and their challenge was to look at the um, travel needs of children with special educational needs. And it was about improving the quality of travel for these kids. So the, the situation was uh, these children uh, would be picked up from home uh, by bus and if you're uh, first on the bus, you might be sat on there for an hour as it picks everyone else up from their houses to take them to school. And similarly, it could be up to an hour sitting on the bus on the way back. So the challenge they had was how do we improve the quality of that journey for the children? And so we went to fantasy land with them and we used a principle from, from lateral thinking, which is just called reverse. You know, you take something and you reverse the order in which it's done. So actually, does that help you think about anything differently? So what we did here, we say rather than taking the, the, uh, the kids to school, what if the school came to the children? So what that got them thinking straight away was, OK, we're talking about the school coming to the children on that journey into work. And that's what flipping around. And suddenly that got them thinking about the time that the children spend on the bus. So at the moment, they weren't doing anything. Uh, but suddenly they thought, what if we start having some nice activities on the bus to do? We have, could have some songs, some games, maybe we could have bingo where you can look out the window and spot things and cross it off. So suddenly that journey isn't just 
nothing time but it becomes an enjoyable interesting it's part of the learning process as you're on your way to school and on the way back as well they really took that idea and they embedded it in a, in a, a new strategy uh, which they called learn as you go they embedded it uh, in the council strategy went down really well with parents kids loved it and really this helped their ultimate aim which was to uh, get these kids to be confident independent travelers as they got older so if we had kids who are enjoying their journey then you're starting to hopefully build that confidence that idea really just came from flipping it around rather than taking the kids to school what if the school came to the kids and suddenly it was that time on the bus let's make better use of it so um i'm going to get you to do a bit of creative thinking here um so let's say this is our problem in footwear. How do we introduce a great new type of footwear or footwear accessory to wow the customers as being the up-to-date items that they just must have? So I'm gonna give you a little technique now uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example. You can have a go at it yourself while we do this uh, and after the session as well. So we're gonna to go to Fantasy World first, Fantasyland. And I'm gonna ask you, have a think about who your favorite film or historical character is. Who are they? Um, and what would they do in fantasy land to create this great new type of footwear? So I've put um, Wonder Woman there and Stephen Hawking, the great, late great physicist. So those are two characters I'm gonna have a think about in fantasy land. What would they do to create something new? So I'll just give you a minute. Uh, if you want to write it in the chat, what, who your favorite film or historical character is, what would they do in Fantasyland, right? Anything goes to actually create a really uh, appealing, novel, new, exciting bit of footwear or footwear accessory. So if, yeah, feel free to write it in the chat. And then we'll share some thoughts. So we're in fantasy land at the moment, anything goes. And we're not thinking about the real world. Don't have any bots, anything happens. Oh, great. Excellent. Batman, a footwear that can make me jump building holes. Oh, yes, that was a good one. Durable, sustainable, big, oh nice, vegan. Mozart, who'd invent shoes that could play music. Excellent, Zorro. Oh, brilliant. Some really cool action footwear from Wolverine that's environmentally friendly. The dude from the Big Lebowski would make them very comfortable. We're like, excellent. You're very good at going to fantasy land, folks. Well done. So the idea is to live in fantasy land for a bit and see what ideas come up. And I'll suggest a couple that I came up with. Uh, one for Wonder Woman, so someone said that with Batman as well, she might create shoes to help elite buildings, tall buildings, Stephen Hawking, lots of physics research on conservation of mass and energy and black holes, it'd be great if you create boots that could generate energy, fusion boots that could generate some energy that we could do great things with. So, we can stay in fantasy land for a bit, but then after a while, what we want to take is those little concepts that you've come up with. Can we translate those back to the real world? So what I'd like you to do then is think, actually, so those ideas that you've got, is there anything that Footwear Limited, living in the real world, could do based on those ideas that you've, that you've come up with already? So again, you can put them in the chat if you want. Um, it'd be good to see some new ideas. I can talk through some ideas that might come into the real world here. So out of um, Wonder Woman's creation of shoes that could help elite buildings, you might actually, but there's something there about height, being able to raise the height of shoes uh, up or down. Um, and that might make us think about, okay, well, there's a lot of people who aren't particularly tall, you know, you can't see, <laughs> I'm not standing up, but I'm not the tallest person in the world. And I'd love to have a bit of height sometimes. You know, for when we get back to going to concerts and gigs, always used to end up standing behind someone who's, who's quite tall. And I never really get to see the band that I paid money to see. So wouldn't it be great if we could have shoes that could, you know, press a little button and it just goes up and it gives a bit of extra height. That'd be great. You know, maybe that's that's a new product that uh, footwear could uh, 
make. Um, with Stephen Hawking's boots that generate energy, so that might make us think about shoes and energy and using kinetic motion, you know, if we're walking around in, in footwear, we're, we're using kinetic energy. So why don't we um, put rechargeable batteries in the heels of the shoes? So as we walk around, that kinetic energy, it charges up the batteries. And then when you run out of power, let's say when you've gone for a walk or in the middle of uh, the countryside, uh, when you're in the middle of nowhere, you know, your phone runs out of uh, uh, power, you can plug it into your shoe and there you go, you're recharging your phone straight away. Um, if you guys have got any realistic suggestions, please put them in, in the uh, in the chat as well. So the Batman one footwear that can make me jump buildings. Yeah, we can we can talk about that. Sustainable ve vegan, uh, vegan, great. Yeah, sustainable. Should that could definitely be something you can look at the materials that are used and look at new markets now. About actually now we're, we're going to change our branding and who we're uh, aiming for. Shoes that can play music. Oh, that's good. So someone said it's in a heightened insole to make you discreetly higher. So that could be a market we start getting into as well. Um, so I hope you can see, just going to Fantasyland, and I've just given you this little steer about favourite characters, uh, historical fictional, just thinking what they would do, hopefully we'll start unlocking you. We're not doing the bots, what would they do? But you might see the seeds of things that you could um, translate back into the real world. Yeah, self-tie laces from uh, Back to the Future. Let's try and get those actually happening. So again, that's a simple technique. But honestly, it can make a big difference. And, and it is just allowing yourself license to, to go somewhere else and just look at something else. And it could be uh, an organization that's in a different sector that's trying to do what you're doing. So your fantasy land is actually something real, but it's somewhere else. And trying to look at elements of what makes that work well that we can then take back into the real world. So that's just a little creative thinking tip, bit of training for you guys today. So please have a go at it after after the session okay so now we've got a nice load of ideas which ones do we choose to take forward so some of us struggle we you know we can come up with ideas but we don't know which ones are actually going to work best but this is where the assess stage comes in and this is where we introduce now you can put the bots that's a good idea but that's going to cost too much but i'm not sure people would like it so much it's fine to introduce it now because now we're going to start screening our ideas by looking at the, the quality of them. What, what is a better quality idea versus a, a, a poorer quality idea? And what we do here is try and get people to be a bit systematic about how they do that. So we get them to say, you know, if your organisation, your context, your team, what criteria would you use to judge whether an idea is a good quality idea or not? So it could be um, that... Um, uh, you know, the, maybe cost is very important for you, that it has to be a, 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 an idea that's not going to cost much, or it might be the, it, the, the novelty factor, it's got to be very different, or it's something that's going to be acceptable uh, around the organisation or to customers. The important thing is you choose the criteria that are important to your context. Um, once you choose those criteria, and when I'm doing workshops, I get people to choose three criteria, for example, then we want to agree a range of scores um, from what is a poor score on that criteria to very good. You might have poor is one, five is very good. So uh, for cost, uh, a poor score of one might be it's going to cost us more than a million to do this. And a, a score of five, which is very good for cost, might be, well, it will cost less than a thousand pounds. So once we've got what our criteria are and what are uh, good and bad, um, uh, good and bad, um, that's that's a good question Edward we'll come back to that later about uh, do you choose a criteria before or after um, it's then a chance to score the ideas in, in uh, what we say is an assessment matrix to see which ideas uh, are the strongest and why so yes Edward we'll come back to your question later on um, so here you can see an example of a, an assessment matrix with our two ideas for shoes, the, the shoes with heels that lift and drop, shoes with chargeable batteries in. Um, we're assessing them against would there be a high benefit to a certain audience or market? Would it be low cost? And would the time to implement be quick or not? And we're using a scale of one is very poor against criteria up to five for very good. So we think with the, the hydraulic shoes, there'll be high benefits. 
there's a lot of people who would like the extra hype when they could get it. Would it be low cost for us as a company to develop? No, it wouldn't. It'd be quite expensive for us to develop because we don't have that technology and we'd have to do quite a bit of research to see how it could be embedded in shoes. And hence also, it would probably take quite, you know, probably one or two years at least before we get to a prototype. So we'll give an overall scoring of seven out of 15. Uh, the shoe rechargeable batteries in, you know, we're all using more and more tech. We're all using more and more mobile technology. So we think there's going to be loads of people who'd like, you know, green energy that you generate yourself. Um, would it be low cost? I, I'm going to say yes, because there is already that type of technology out there. I've got a, a watch that uh, basically um, has got a, a little battery in it that charges itself up as you, from your arm motion. As you walk along, it uses that kinetic motion to charge itself up. So that's already there. It's a case of putting that in a shoe. And hence, we can think we could probably get something out in, in a few months as a prototype to start testing out, just something that sits in your heel. And overall, we'd give it a better rating. So comparing the two, we can get a sense of which, which idea is stronger and why. Uh, and that why is important because later on selling your idea to others and it's good to know why you uh, to, to tell others why you think that's a good idea that you've got. So that then brings us to the select bit. The final bit is uh, uh, the ideas bit is you've scored your ideas, you've seen what the scores on the doors are, now it's a chance to bring your best ideas together. It's actually this is the solution that I think. So we started off by saying, you know, profits are declining in um, Footwear Limited. A big reason for that in the diagnosed stage was that uh, demand for our products is going down because it seems so to be too old fashioned. In the erupt stage, we came up with various ideas for new, really whizzy types of products um, to the hydraulic shoe and then the electro shoe with the batteries in. And assessing those two ideas against each other, we actually think the electro shoe is, uh, is, is the one we want to go with. That seems to get the best balance. And having those um, objective criteria that we score against, it's easier to get consensus among people rather than someone just saying, I'm the boss, it's, it must be a good idea because I'm the boss. Having these criteria makes it much clearer about what makes a good idea or not. Um, I also talk about I mean, ideas you can take ideas that work together. So one idea might be one need or one sector, another idea might meet another. Or you can have short, medium and long term. So in the shorter term, we might develop the electro shoe, but in the longer term, we might think actually we like the idea of the, the hydraulic lift shoe. So that might be something that we develop in the longer term that we start looking for funding or partners to help us develop that. But our immediate focus is to get the electro shoe out there because we think we can manage it. That's the ideas bit, folks. So it's just going systematically through a series of steps and paces. And, and, and I think part of the reason I, I developed Clear Ideas was, you know, we are time poor. We're always struggling to have enough time to work through things. And I, we've all been in many meetings or groups where we go around in circles talking about things. You come out and you think we haven't got anywhere. So the idea stage should help you go through a, a series of steps to actually get somewhere in, in terms of moving things, uh, moving things on. But of course, once you come up with the ideas, how are you, how are you actually going to get them working? Yeah, it's a, that's quite a great idea. It will really turn the fortunes around a Footwear Limited. But, you know, here's a little picture from Dragon's Den uh, where we see some potentially great ideas fall by the wayside because people haven't really thought about implementing their ideas or what it will take to put them into practice. So research shows us there's loads of uh, reasons why good ideas don't make it uh, into practice, that you don't have the skills to make it work. So maybe our workforce our designers don't have the technology skills to, to implement the electro shoe. There's a lack of motivation. People maybe think that things will be all right if we carry on as they are. We don't want to do anything too different. We might have innovation leadership, lack of investment, a culture where people don't want to try new things. People don't really uh, keep an eye on how things are progressing. There's not good enough communication. There's not enough involvement from users, from um, uh, other people in the workforce, from clients, patients, etc. So looking at those reasons, that led to the development of, of the clear stages. So five things that make a difference. We know from research that make a difference to the implementation uh, of ideas. We're not saying those are the only ones, but the five that will make a difference. And, and it's about manageability in the scale of the model. So first of all, the C in clear then is about commit to doing. So this is about motivating yourself. Is it worth your while doing this? 
but also others. How do you motivate other people to support the idea that the people that need to give you support, how do you get their buy-in to actually move move it forward into implementation? I've got a picture of post-its there because Spencer Silver and the guy who developed uh, post-its worked for 3M for many years. So his job was um, making um, glues and, and one day accidentally came up with a, a glue that sort of stuck things together but did not really that well and then he took it to his bosses and his bosses said well that's a waste of time if you've got glue that doesn't stick stuff together solidly and properly what's the point um, but Spencer thought there must be a use for a weak glue and he kept on going to his bosses and uh, they kept on knocking him back and it took him five years before they actually uh, recognized it could be a use of this so there's a lot of perseverance there uh, and it's finding out the best way to get buying and commitment uh, from um, from other people like management, uh, users, etc. So what we find from research as well that there's the best innovators are very good at tailoring their arguments for different stakeholders. So we might have uh, you know one argument for top management. Um, uh, we might have you know top management might be worried about doing something different, and we might say okay if you look at other sectors. You know, you can see the first movers really having an advantage in terms of putting something in new. And in the long term, this will really help the profile of the organization. Our workforce might be reluctant about working with technology. Uh, they might say, we don't, we're not that interested in, in getting involved in electro issue. But if we say, OK, we can train you to work with electrics to build the electro issue. And actually, what all that will do is give you an extra qualification that you can use to enhance your employability that then might get them on board as well. And it's also acknowledging that failure is an option when we come to innovation. That's absolutely a given. There's loads of things that haven't worked. Uh, but, the, you know, a couple of things are about mitigating against risk. So making sure that if things don't work, there's not too much negative fallout. So you might do a little pilot in a certain area to try something out rather than doing everything all at once. But it's also about learning from failures in the past. There's a, there's a lot of situations where people just abandon being done. And um, it... it and, and don't really take away the useful stuff. So it might have been one or two small tweaks that could have made a lot of difference. So commitment, get commitment from key stakeholders and what the, how, and what the strategies you're going to use to get their buy. Second, the L in clear is that lead, lead the initiative. So we need things happen when people make things happen. So we need people who are either formal or informal leaders of, of the initiative to take things uh, forward and put them into practice. So we want people here who possess the relevant knowledge, skills, of authority, who've got the autonomy to lead the initiative. But also more generally, research tells us that the good leaders of innovation are people who scout widely for new ideas. They'll look at different sectors. They'll look at different sources to see what we can learn uh, that we can apply here. Then again, they're good at involving different stakeholders. Uh, they tailor arguments to each stakeholder. They use both formal and informal channels to sell their ideas, that they'll do memos, do little reports, presentations, but they'll also have conversations with people at lunches and dinners and say, look, I've got this great idea that I think will make a big difference to you. They convey confidence and enthusiasm. They are selling that idea as well. So if they're not that appearing to be that confident themselves, then other people are going to pick up on that and think, well, maybe I won't bother going along with it. And they're very good at empowering their followers. So and, and making the most of the ideas and the skills that people around them have. As well as the lead, it's not just about the leader, it's about what other skills do we need, uh, what other capabilities do we need in our team to deliver. So of course, with the electro shoe, we need people who've got technological skills that we want to bring in. So we've got to think about how we get them involved. Lots of innovations fall apart in the implementation stage because you don't have the right uh, set of skills with the right people in there. So thinking and planning around that will make a difference. So we need to decide who's going to do what as well. Engage. So we did a study of 500 organizations a few years ago where we um, asked them to describe major innovations that they'd introduced, uh, describe how successful they'd been or not been across a whole range of criteria, and um, uh, then um, asked them a series of questions about how those innovations have been developed. And one of the biggest predictors of, of that innovation success was the extent to which those organizations had engaged in negotiation and discussion with, with users or people who are going to actually be uh, applying the innovation. 
Um, I've got washing powder tablets there because I think this this little story brings it to life. So I, I went to a, a research and development day with a major company uh, that makes washing powders and, and invented uh, the washing powder tablet. It's quite interesting hearing them talking about the, you know, the washing powder tablet uh, because they said they used to have focus groups with the public and at the in these focus groups they would uh ask people what do you think about the idea of a, a tablet washing powder tablet something you can you know just bung into the drum uh, and that's it you know so it's got a set dose and people would say well i'm not really sure we need a tablet because you know we have boxes of washing powder and you know you can put it in the compartment and it's you know it's fine you know we don't really need it but one day um some of the engineers there in this company thought well why don't we mock something up Let's, let's create what we think might be look like washing powder tablets. So they took them along to focus groups and they put these tablets on the table. Said to me, what do you think about these washing powder tablets? Is that a good idea? What they got then was people started picking them up and saying, ah, that's what you're talking about. Well, maybe if it was a bit bigger or, you know, where would it go? Would it go in the, the compartment with the powder? Where would it go at the back? Could you add other things into it? And what happens there, they suddenly got a way to engage with, with their, their users because they had something physically to get hold of. And sometimes our ideas are a bit too abstract for people to get hold of. So creating sort of little prototypes or mock-ups, mock I know phone companies now, uh, when they're developing new phones, start off with little cardboard templates about what an interface might look like. They don't go to the whole digital interface, but they'll start with little mock-ups to try and get a sense of uh, something for people to get hold of. And once they get hold of it, then they can then start uh, talking a bit more about what would make it work better. So here we're talking about getting the views of users, uh, uh, for example, through maybe interviews or surveys, focus groups, we might go and observe what people are doing or saying and how they might react to different ways of doing things. But that engaging with people throughout the process uh, and different stakeholders is quite an important thing. And I think that's come quite strongly clear in, in the workshops that we've been doing over the years, that the collaborative aspect is quite important in this clear ideas process. Is we, we normally do get a cross section of people working together uh, on a challenge or a problem, and it's quite good to see them bringing their different perspectives um, all through that process. So, in that engage stage, two things you're doing one is you're motivating users because you're talking to people like them or them directly, and also they're giving you that that really valuable knowledge about what make that might make that an even stronger idea uh, or a more rigorous idea that would that would really really work for them and we don't do that enough uh, hopefully we're starting to use that more it's a lot about user-centered design we're nearly there um, so this fourth step in clear is about strategic alignment for delivery we can have a great idea, but again, innovations fall apart because you haven't really lined up to that innovation to who you want, how you want, when you want properly. So if we talk about Fort Will Limited, we can talk about internal alignment. So we can say within the organization, have we got enough personnel to make the electro shoe? Have they got the right skills? Have we got the technology to put it into place? Have we got the funding? Do we need to raise some more finance? Do we need to stop making certain tartan slippers maybe so we can put that funding into this we're going to need to rebrand ourselves you know if we're going to have this new technology thing we might well we do need to rebrand ourselves uh, as, as this you know, high-tech footwear organization uh, and maybe we need to change our culture as well into something that is a bit more responsive to technology and energy needs externally as other organized we need to align with who really would be the people who'd really like to uh, by this type of footwear. So maybe our, own, our you know, current market is, is sort of retired folks, like comfortable shoes and comfortable slippers. But with the electro shoe, maybe we're going for really that high tech sector of the market, fast moving, high tech. So, you know, let's focus on our reference on who we're going to focus, uh, who we're going to target as our audience, who would be the right suppliers to work with, who for our uh, values, uh, our finances, what skills, we need to align with regulation. You know, if we're bringing technology into footwear, we need to be aware about recycling of batteries. How long are these batteries going to last in the shoes? Do you throw the shoes away? Do you recycle them? Wouldn't it be great if we could bring the shoes back to us after a year or two years and we give them a, a little discount on the next pair of shoes, like a little Timberland 
strategy there is that, that you do the recycling, it's more environmentally friendly, but also people come back to you to, to get the next updated pair of shoes and, and aligning your policy. So this is about taking time to, to ask these questions about who are the right audience, who are the right partners, suppliers, have we you know, aligned with the regulations and policy, have we thought about that? So sometimes we rush into something without realising that we need to have addressed these things and sometimes it's too late once we're out there we might get hit by various lawsuits because we hadn't really thought about the regulations or the recycling and off we go. And the final bit here then uh, is review. So this is about setting goals and milestones for implementation. Again, some, some research systematic review we did a few years ago for what was then the Department of Trade and Industry and the government many years ago. Uh, we looked at the implementation of new practices in manufacturing firms and we found lots of studies said that those organisations that set goals for implementing those practices and monitor those goals were more successful in that implementation. It, it, it's, it's logical, you know, if you set a goal, you'll keep an eye on it. There's lots of great ideas and I've seen the enthusiasm and then, you know, a little bit of time later, it's like, well, we didn't really get around to when we're going to do it. And I've got these things that are more urgent and it just drifts off. And where we've seen those impacts that I've described already is, is where there's been this regular reviewing and progressing uh, of things to put into practice. So one of the examples I gave was a council redeveloping an adult social care service that saved a million and a half pounds. Uh, it took them two years from running the original uh, Clear Ideas workshop but to then progressing it to a point where it was launched and they could estimate what the savings were. But they had a good plan. They had good plans and milestones. So I suppose you can think about smart objectives here. I suppose the final bit of the model then is, is to introduce the sunshine. So that's two reasons. One, it's always nice to see some sunshine. Um, and second, um, the spikes of the sunshine here uh, show that this is an iterative process that you can move backwards and forwards between different stages. So I talked about the engage stage, engaging users. Well, we might bring them right in at the illuminate stage and the diagnose stage. We might get them to work with us to say, okay, what are the problems with, with our footwork? Might get some customers to work with us <laughs> into saying, okay, why do you think these are old fashioned? What are the problems you have with your footwear that you would like solving with new types of footwear? Um, you know, we might come up with our preferred idea uh, and then we might find actually we can't get enough buy-in from others. So we might go back and pick another idea or do a bit more idea generation. Or we might come up with a problem for aligning with a certain sector of the market and that might lead us to come up with more ideas to deal with that problem. So innovation isn't this clear linear process in, in real life, but you can move backwards and forwards uh, through these stages. And I think it is important that you attend to these different elements because our research, not necessarily our research, research in the area does show that these things make a difference. So, you know, the ideas bit is about, hey, it's about coming up with something that is new and that should have impact. And the clear bit is about having impact from something new. If you just have the ideas, you can have ideas that don't go anywhere. If you just have clear, we can have changes that aren't very new from what came on before. Uh, but if you bring the two together, you can have a very powerful and potent combination. So that's about bringing us to the end. That's the model. Hopefully you've understood it. Hopefully there's elements that you can use. Uh, think about the fantasy land approach. Have a go with a problem that you've got. Just sit down, give you a few minutes to go to fantasy land, come up with some ideas, and then see if you can translate them back to the real, um, to the real world. So just to round off with a couple of things. As I said, we do lots and lots of workshops and organisations and with COVID, of course, we can't do the face-to-face -face stuff, but we are doing things online now, so we're learning more about virtual collaboration. Um, we've got some free apps as well, if you want to try the model out yourselves or with, with others. So uh, the iPad app uh, is, if you look on the uh, App Store, the iPad only app, there's a Clear Ideas thing, which takes you through the different stages. And um, we've also got an online app on our website, so you just need to register for it. So again, give those two a go. Um, you've got nothing to lose. And I'll round off with that. Any questions, if you want to contact me, if you want any more information, if you want to get hold of that paper, if you can't get hold of it, 